God made them all. Each little flower that opens, each little bird that sings, He made the glowing colors, He made the tiny wings. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. Headed mountain, That brightens up the sky All things bright and beautiful All creatures great and small All things wise and wonderful The Lord God made them all Cold wind in the winter the pleasant summer sun, the ripe fruit in the garden, he made them every one. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. He gave us eyes to see them and lips that me may tell how great is God Almighty who made all things well. All things bright and beautiful all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. Truly, Lord, this is the day that you have made. May we rejoice in it, cherish in it, value it, Use each moment to love each other and to remember you. Amen. So before we're seated, if you'll just join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. We're going to speak to the children in a moment. Is Paul available to come and do the reading? Where are you? Come and do the reading. Before we do the reading today from Mark and the Messiah, which is what the message is from, just reminding ourselves that last time we looked at the two daughters. There was Veronica, who had the issue of blood for 12, for 10 years. And then there was the son, uh, the daughter of, help me out here. Jairus. That, yes, thank you, Jairus. That's it. Uh, the daughter of Jairus. And these two events occurred together, and they speak to us of our need to keep coming back to the Lord that he might put life there in us, that we don't let those things in us perish. But it's right out of this that the Lord now goes into the reading that we're about to have. He's going to go into his own hometown and he's not going to be so well received there. This uh, <coughs> reading from the book of Mark, chapter 6. And he went out from thence and came into his own country. And his disciples follow him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? 
And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honour, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk, and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went round the villages, teaching. Beautiful, thanks Paul. Jesus says we're blessed when we can come to him, hear his words and obey them. Amen. So in a moment we'll go into Holy Supper. But before we do, let's begin by having, can I just have the little ones out the front here? Well, I've got two here. There's, yeah, come on, come in out the front. Did I see Matthew here earlier, is he floating around somewhere? Not to worry. <laughs> ah, a bit half little. I want to talk today about Jonas. We know the story, pretty much everyone knows the story of Jonas and the big fish. Some say the whale, but it was a big fish. Do we, do we, do we know the story? Pretty familiar with it? Yeah. I mean, it's one of those stories that really sticks with you because he gets swallowed up, which is quite tragic. But do we, do we know who, who Jonah, Jonas is in terms of what he did. What's what, what we call someone like Jonah? Mm -hmm. He was a... What's that? Prophet. Yes, he was a prophet. Do, and we know what prophets are, don't we? They're those strange people that wandered around, mostly in Israel back in the day. But they had the unthankful job sometimes of telling people a message from God. I mean, just imagine, you know, you're going about your day and suddenly you hear a voice from heaven speak to you. And it says, come here, I have something to tell you. Calls you by name, and then you realize you're talking to God. And then God says, I want you to go and share this message. So let's go to Jonas for a moment. I can imagine God comes to him and speaks to him, and he says, yes, my turn. I get to go and share something. And mostly, the messages would be in, in Palestine or, or Israel, and they'd be there talking to God's people. But that's not what happened to Jonah. God says to Jonah, Jonah, I have a very special task for you. I want you to go and speak to Nineveh. And you might say, well, who's Nineveh and where are they? Nineveh is so far over here, past Syria, down Babylon down here and Turkey here. And Nineveh is way over here, about 700 miles, over 1,000 kilometers. is a long, long, long way away. And Nineveh, really has nothing to do with God's people as far as Jonah's concerned. And so God says, I want you to go speak to, 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 to these people. And Jonah starts thinking to himself, well, there's some very bad, wicked people. And they really, they really could use a bit of punishment, you know, teach them a lesson for how they behave and teach people. And you want me to go and, 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 and preach to them and doesn't always happen, but, but sometimes when you preach to people, they listen and they change. And these people are going to get away with all sorts of bad things that they've done. Now, I don't think I like this idea very much. And God says, no, I want you to go speak to them. Go, go and t tell them to turn from their ways. And Jonah sa say, says to himself, no, nah, I'm, I'm not going to do this. I'm not, no, they, they deserve what they get. So Jonas decides, if they're over there, way up to the northeast, I'm going to head the other direction. So he heads towards the, the coast, and Jonah jumps on a boat, and he flees from God. Or he tries to flee from God. I mean, it's quite funny when we think about it, isn't it? Can, can we flee from God, really? We're not, we can't really, can we? No matter where you go, God's there. So we can't run away. But I get Jonah's logic. At least if I'm as far away from these people 
as I can be, well, that's going to kind of mess up God's plans a little bit, maybe. Yeah. Okay, so he starts heading on the boat, and the captain receives him, and the people receive him, and they, the story reads as if they're very godly people themselves. And then not long after being on the water, they're hit with waves and storms. And the captain decides, if we all get together and pray, maybe God can spare us. And he gets everyone together to pray and finds that Jonah's asleep. Wakes Jonah up. Imagine being Jonah, right? You don't even know there's a storm. You're so exhausted from running from God. You get on the boat, you have a sleep. Next thing you know, the captain's waking you up. And the captain says, please, pray for us. We're perishing. And Jonah's already going, oh, I stopped praying to God a few days ago. I said, I didn't want to talk to him at the moment. I'm running from God. Don't ask me to pray to God. And then he gets convicted. These people are going to die because of me. He says, Captain, it's me. I'm disobeying God. Throw me over the boat. You'll be spared. What? Do it. Do it. Throw me over the boat. Imagine being that captain and having to actually throw Jonah off the boat. But he pleaded with them and they threw him off the boat. And then the storm settled. But how far out in the water must have they been? Like it's a long way, way too far. Way too far to swim. And this is the bit that most of us know, you know, where Jonah gets swallowed up by a big fish. You know, you would imagine this big fish coming out and you're thinking, yeah, I'm getting what I deserve. I'm becoming lunch. But it's not. I mean, this is God's way of actually saving him. It says that he goes inside the beast. He's kept safe and alive. And then he gets a free ride back to the mainland. I don't think we think of it much like that, do we? We just think getting swallowed by a beast. Have you ever, adults, have you ever been swallowed by a beast? Ever had something in your life overtake you so much that you felt you were being swallowed up? And you might have been wondering uh, um, what terrible thing you've done to God to be swallowed up as well, when in fact it might just be that God has a plan to save you. So that's what's going on here. God is actually saving Jonah. But something happens between this. We go back for a moment. While Jonah is in the belly of the whale, and he, or beast or whatever it is, some fish, and, and he realizes he's not dying, he starts praying to God again. Say after me, just bow your heads. Just say, Dear Lord, thank you for being with me. Wherever I am, you love me and you have a plan for me. Amen. So Jonah starts to pray while he's in the beast and he changes his heart and in there he says, all right, I'll do what you want, God. Anyone ever had that one? Ever have, have God sort of telling you, go a certain direction? You don't want to go that direction, then eventually you find yourself going, this is the right direction. I will do what you've asked of me, Lord. So that's Jonah. So he comes back and he's decided, he's determined, from there he's now going to do a month or more footwork and make his way to Nineveh. So he gets to Nineveh and, and Jonah's still hoping just a little bit, just a little bit of hope. Maybe they'll ignore me. Maybe they won't respond. Maybe they'll throw me out and they'll get the punishment they deserve. But these people really respond. Jonah preaches to them and they respond genuinely with repentance. I so, okay, that's where the story should end. It's a nice ending to the story, isn't it? There, right there. But it doesn't. There's one more chapter in the book of Jonah. It says Jonah decides to go and hang outside the city and just kind of watch. Maybe they'll get destroyed anyway. He's still kind of holding on to these kind of resentful feelings. Now, I don't know about you, but tell me if you're feeling a bit, a bit like Jonah's a prophet and from God. Why has he got such a bad attitude towards these people? You know, have you ever... You know? It wasn't until I one day discovered this very important fact Nineveh and Israel have been at war at times. And during those wars, prisoners have been taken. And some of those Israeli prisoners, some of the prison Hebrew prisoners, were treated so badly, I'm not going to mention what they did. It was too horrific. And you can imagine this prophet Jonah knowing the horrific things these people did. 
to his family. And thinking, no, 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 that, that deserves, that is just too bad. Any of us have some, some of those? Some things that we think, that's just too bad, and, uh, you know, I reckon God just needs to deal with this, you know. We have some of those? Yeah. But this is the kind of loving God and merciful God that we have. That even when we've done terrible things, he's still hoping that we will turn, change our hearts. And that's what happened. They turned. So Jonah's just, I understand Jonah's attitude now when, when you read about the terrible things they did to each other. So Jonah's hanging outside Nineveh, hoping for it to be destroyed. And this beautiful, this beautiful vine, God makes this beautiful vine grow up to cover him. It's just, it's just wonderful. And Jonah is very thankful for this vine growing up. Then the next day, a worm comes and eats the vine and it dies. And you can see Jonah is happy one minute and really upset the next. And then the Lord speaks to Jonah and says, Jonah, you were really happy for that plant when it was growing so well. And you were very unhappy when the worm came and ate it. Did you make the plant or did you make the worm? Did you do any of it? And should you really be angry at my loving and forgiving people? He's saying, I made these people. And sometimes they're good and sometimes they're bad. Is it really right that you're angry with them? But Jonah is such a good story for us because as you grow up, there will be times where you're going to find things not going the way you hoped. And you might be praying to God and asking him for help. And you might even be offended at what God asks you to do at that point in time. And God might tap you on the shoulder and say, you know that cousin you haven't spoken to in three years? Or whoever, you need to go and talk to them. And God might tap you on the shoulder in some way and, and ask you to do something. We don't want to be offended when that time comes. So let's bow our heads and pray. Just say, dear Lord, keep me a child in your heart, always willing to follow you never offended, always trusting you, for you are good, and your ways are good. Amen. Well, thank you for letting me share that story with your children, with Jonah. We're just going to have Holy Supper, and then, or you may take them now if you want. You want to take them now? I have a reading here for, for Holy Supper. I, I, I wonder if I could ask Paul again to come and read it. Sorry, Paul. I did have someone planned, but they couldn't make it today. This reading's from John. And what we're going to find as we prepare our hearts for Holy Supper, Jesus preached a sermon about Holy Supper that actually offended most of his disciples. Most of his disciples turned away from him that day. Let's, let's read that, Paul, thanks. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father, which hath sent me draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God. He hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eats of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. 
The Jews, therefore, strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Oh, sorry, keep going. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is an hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? And then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Notice the words of Peter, the way he responded. I just find them so very, very comforting the way Peter responded to the Lord. You're going to find, and you will have found, and certainly we emphasize a lot in the new church, that the word has a much deeper side to it. That if we only deal with the literal sense, this is where we're going to find ourselves offended with God. They couldn't look at what Jesus was saying and what he was teaching. They looked at the man and just said, you're born one of us. How could you be the bread of heaven? They couldn't understand what the Lord was saying. But Peter's response is where we find this real hope and courage. You know, he, he's in the same boat as all of them. I don't understand what you're saying, Jesus. I mean, I really don't get it. But I don't know anyone else that has the words of life. I think every one of us here at some point have read the word and it's grabbed us, hasn't it? It's grabbed our heart and we've gone, there's life here. There's something more here. I sense in Jesus' words more than just a man. And like Peter, we need to be able to be that little child and say, I, I don't know, I, do, I don't understand everything, but I trust that you have the words of life. Who else has the words of life? Amen. So as we gather around the Lord's table today and we take that bread, remember that the bread represents the Lord's love for us, his heart towards us. And the wine represents his teaching or his words for us. Ken, would you come help? <coughs> On that last faithful night, sitting around that table, the Lord lifted up the bread to heaven and he gave a blessing. And then he broke the bread and he said, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat. looking at me. Your word says to us, Lord, to taste and see that you are good. And again on that faithful night, the Lord took a cup and he lifted it to heaven and after giving a blessing, he turned to his disciples and he said, This is my blood shed for the remission of sins of many. Drink ye all of it.
Jesus said, I am the light of the world. If any man will walk in that light, he will know life. Amen. first started reading over Mark 6 to decide to decide what, what direction should we go? There's just so much in here. <coughs> One of these, this passage here particularly, I've heard it over the years used in many cases where people will say, oh, well, see, God is rendered powerless by us. Or maybe even things like, oh, God doesn't heal anymore. That kind of stuff. So that kind of teaching can, well, I shouldn't say teaching, but that kind of thinking can come out of this text. I'd like to look at that a little bit today, but where I felt most at peace to talk about was how we can get offended at God and each other. We don't mean to, we don't we try not to, but it's one of the greatest strategies of hell, is to actually make us offended with each other and with God, because the result is unbelief. Unbelief. Think of it this way. We, we, we think of... Uh, unbelief we, th we think of unbelief as a lack of belief yeah that would be natural if you thought of it that way unbelief oh God help my unbelief and you might say oh well it's because I lack a belief or faith it's not actually not it's something far more sinister than that uh, if this were plugged into the wall it's not well over here here's a cable this is plugged into the wall. Plugged in, I think, switched on. But I'm not getting electrocuted. Why? Is there no power in it? There's power in it. There's enough power in there to send me to Jesus right now. <laughs> there really is. But why am I not getting electrocuted? What, what's interfering with that process? That's how I think of unbelief. It's insulated. Unbelief is not just a lack of faith. Unbelief is an actual offence that stands between you and God. So if I get a knife right now and start hacking away at that cable, how much of that unbelief or insulation do I need to hack away at before I get it? Before I get, you know, 240 volts of thoof. You would say, not much maybe a mustard seed's worth? Now we're getting an idea of what Jesus is talking about in other places when disciples say, oh, how can we do this, increase our faith? And Jesus says, you don't need an increase in faith. Your problem is not your faith. It's all the unbelief. It's all of the offences that we can carry without even knowing that we're actually carrying them towards God. I mean, we're reading in Holy Supper there, how, because of one statement, people became offended with Jesus. And over 70 left because they didn't understand. It is a bit graphic. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. That's graphic, isn't it? But they weren't thinking spiritually. They were thinking naturally. And this is what our, one of our biggest challenges. And we do it. Look at all the denominations and all the religions and all the movements out there. We humans are so good at thinking naturally and applying it to God and creating our little barriers as a process, isn't it? We, we do. Unbelief is a substance. It's, it, it's the opposite of electricity. It's not a lack of electricity. It's standing in the way, stopping you from getting it in that sense. Now, before I talk about, um, I've got seven ways that I see that we can, there's probably many, many more, but seven today that I want to talk about how we can get offended at God and each other, let's just sort of lay a little bit of a, a reminder or foundation about how big is God? Is it fair to say that? I mean, even the word big, is it really fair? How big is God? I mean, you could say God is so big that big is not even a word, isn't it? In fact, we use words like infinity, infinite. So let's try and put this into some sort of context. How big is the universe, our known universe? If you could travel as fast as light, as fast as light, let's say you could run like the flash, as fast as light, from here 
just to the edge of our little solar system take you a year and a half. A year and a half of travelling at the speed of sunlight just to get to the edge of our solar system. Then the next solar system might be Andromeda or one of those sort of another, another two more years of keeping up that running at that speed. And these are just little tiny solar systems. In, in our branch of the universe, this Milky Way, if you want to get from one side to the other, how long? From one side to the other, running like the flash, the speed of light, 100,000 years. 100,000 years of moving at the speed of light just to get from one side to the other. How big is the universe? It just does your head in. How big is the universe? And the universe is not even an atom inside the divine. Not even an atom inside the divine. I mean, we can't imagine how big the divine is. We read in Swedenborg that there are actually three heavens. You know, three heavens. Natural, spiritual, spiritual, and celestial. Those that um, love God and, and live a, a good life. Those that love the truth. And, and pursue the truth, and then those that love him, Jesus. Those three sort of heavens. But how big are they? Again, each one of those is way bigger than, you know, we, you talk about heaven, because right now it's just kind of like an idea, isn't it? Somewhere I hope I go when I die. But it's not. It's so much more. In fact, you, couldn't, you can't separate material creation and spiritual life. You just cannot separate them. Heaven and earth are inseparable in that sense. So heaven is far, far bigger than we can understand. And even if you spent eternity exploring it, you'd never reach its end. And I'm sure we'll get to do some of that by the grace of God. But that's not what it's for. What, what is the purpose of heaven, really? You know, it's, it's somewhere we hope to go one day, isn't it? Heaven, hopefully. But what is the purpose of heaven? It really is the meeting place of God and man. That's its real purpose. A couple of passages here from Swedenborg that I'd like to run through before we move on to the offences. In Divine Providence 28, we read, Heaven is conjunction with the Lord. Heaven is not heaven owing to the angels, but owing to the Lord. For the love and the wisdom which angels possess and which make heaven come, not from them, but from the Lord. Indeed, love and wisdom are the Lord in them. So what makes heaven so incredibly special is not angels or something else or buildings or the music or all the beautiful things people say they've seen. What makes heaven so incredible is God. It's where man and God meet. And meet in a way forever. We, we, you know, we, I like to say it this way. Earth is our womb. It's our womb. We're not here forever. It, it's really a preparation ground for an eternal relationship with God, depending on how we live. I mean, you can't live like a devil and say that I'm going to be with God. It doesn't work that way. Just clarify. <laughs> okay, so mo moving on to another passage. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Again, when we realize that heaven is the purpose of our existence, that we are created by God to have a relationship with him, starts to give you some understanding of why the Lord is saying, I am preparing a place for you to dwell and be my family. This is probably one of my favourite passages from Divine Providence, the book Divine Providence. There is a clear image of what is infinite and eternal in the angelic heaven. The angelic heaven is also one of the things that we need to know about. Every religious person thinks about it and wants to go there. Heaven, though, is granted only to people who know the path to it and follow that path. Now, this is, uh, you know, this is quite, if, if you've been in Christianity for some time, 
you'll have come across this idea that just say a prayer and you're going to heaven. That's what we've been taught. And that's actually not true. I mean, it starts with a prayer. Your relationship with God starts with a prayer. But the Lord said, repent and turn and walk differently. You know, we need to change the way we live. And heaven is for those who are preparing themselves right now to have heaven in their heart. We, we, we like to think, I hope I go there one day. But to the degree that we've prepared our hearts now to receive the Lord, is the degree that we are walking with him in heaven. It, it, it's the pathway that we have, people who know that pathway and follow it. And reading on this paragraph goes on to say, we can know the path to heaven to some extent, simply by considering what the people who make up heaven are like. Realizing that no one can become an angel or get to heaven unless he or she arrives, bringing along some angelic quality from the world. Inherit in that angelic quality, love, joy, peace, self-control, you know, the fruits of the spirit, is a knowing of the path from having walked it and a walking in the path from having knowing it. And too often, again, I, I, I've just seen over centuries of Christianity where we're kind of holding on to a knowledge of it is enough. If I know about it, well, that's enough. But I love the way this is saying here, you, you've got to walk it. You've got to walk the path. That's how you know, doesn't it? You've got to walk it to know it. And then you've got to know it to walk it. It's not that easy to just walk a path of being spiritual unless you've got people around you who are encouraging you and, and saying, no, that's not right. This is right. Or let's go back to those Ten Commandments. You know, this is the right way to walk with God. And then paragraph 63 of Doctrine of Sacred Text. This is such a big one because, again, having the Bible isn't giving us our pathway. Knowing the Bible, quoting the Bible, is not living the Bible. That's our biggest challenge, I think, is how do we live it? The literal sense of the word makes possible a connection with angels in heaven because the literal sense has in it a spiritual sense and a celestial sense. And these senses, the angels know, these senses unfold from the word's natural sense, namely its literal sense, when a sincere person is intent on it. The unfolding is instantaneous and according, accordingly also is the affiliation. That's such a, a big key. If, you are, if you're reading the Bible because it's something you've been told to do, it's kind of like, oh, well, I've got to read it. You know, this is what I've been told to do. Then it's going to be a burden to you. But if you actually read it, believing there is a spirit of, a much deeper spirit of God in it, then it will open itself to you. It will, maybe not straight away. The connection is there. Straight away the connection is there. But it will open itself. And that's what we, we find in, in the rest of that passage. I'll read it in a minute. I'm, lay I'm laying this foundation because what I want us to understand is that unless we protect that child inside our heart, that state of innocence that God gives us, when we first meet the Lord, we all have this sense of freshness, of hope, of newness. It's that child inside us. If we don't protect that, it's so easy for the enemy to come in with offences. And when those offences start to come in, all we're left with is our natural thinking. And it's so easy from there to read the Bible in its literal sense and be offended with it. I have friends that will not read the Old Testament because it's full of wars and bloods and horrors. And, and it does. And if you read it as a literal book, it is quite offensive. But when you realize it actually reveals a much deeper message of the life of the Messiah on earth, it's all hidden in there then it becomes a treasure trove, something worth reading because there's these treasures hidden in it. Not easy, though. Not easy to look past whole cities being burnt up in fire or whole nations being wiped out. It's quite, you know, in its literal sense, the word can be quite offensive. And if we're not taught that it's a spiritual book with a much deeper meaning, that's where our offenses are going to come. They're going to come in. But it may not even be that for you. You know, it, it, it could just be, we'll look at them, it could be something like, God didn't answer my prayer. It could be that simple. <clears throat> All right, one more passage here I want to look at. <clears throat> I want to finish that other passage and then we'll talk about offences. Without this kind of a word, you know, the Bible is not like any other book. It's not, you know, it's a history book, it's got poetry, it's got all sorts of dramas and horrors and all sorts of things in it and love stories. 
But without God writing a text which we can approach in a very natural way and then let him speak to us, without that, we basically would have no connection with God. And this is the hard part that we have to understand, uh, that w w why that is, because we're so much in our natural self. But the scripture is written in such a way that you can read it as a natural book, and then it begins to open up its deeper spiritual side to you. Without this kind of a word, you know, a bi the Bible containing an inner sense, there would be no light of heaven among the people of our earth, and consequently no union with heaven for them or us. For the amount of heaven's light there is among us determines the union and therefore the extent to which we have any revelation of divine truth through the word. The reason people do not know this union exists through the spiritual meaning of the word corresponds, corresponding to the natural is that people on our earth do not know anything about angels, spiritual thinking and conversation. We're just so ignorant about how angels communicate and how they communicate. They still have books and they still read and they still talk and they still do things like we do. But the communication is so much deeper. And as soon as you open that Bible and start to read it, whether you understand what it's saying or not, if you're coming looking for God, immediately there's a connection with God and with angels, which is kind of what I'm saying here. <coughs> but the more light you can get out of it, the better. Okay, because ultimately, there's a lot of churches with a lot, w w w um, what am I trying to say? There's a lot of churches and there can be a lack of light. But then the human body is not all heart, is it? Or all brain. It's got different functions, doesn't it? And some churches just really struggle to get deep into the Word of God. But they love God and that's what matters. They're reading the Bible and they've got it. And then other churches and other people go much deeper. And so as long as there is some of us on earth making those connections, that flows through all spiritual communities. It really does. Just like a heart beating. <coughs> so it is important that we are trying to go deeper with the Lord continuously. Okay? That as, as much light as you can get from the Word, the stronger your connection with heaven is going to be. All right, let's... <coughs> they also have said that if we knew that this kind of meaning existed in the Bible, when we read the word and did our thinking with that knowledge of it, we would come into deeper wisdom and be closely united to heaven because this is the way we would have access to concepts like those of angels. So moving on to offenses now, the kind of way that hell tries to block us from having this relationship with God. We read the, we read the word, it makes no sense to us, Sometimes we read it and it can be quite offensive. I remember reading in the book of Jeremiah how God was sending his people off into Babylon. He said, what do you see, Jeremiah? Two bags of figs, good ones and rotten ones. Oh, the good ones, they're my good people. And I'm sending them off into Babylon. And I remember thinking, I'm offended. I'm offended, God. That goes against my theology. Why would you send your people into Babylon? That makes no sense at all. But this is the problem. Often God has a plan. While they were there in Babylon, they were protected from the rest of the nations. Jonah's in a beast. Why would you do that, God? But he's being protected. So many times we're in a, a, a situation where we don't understand what the Lord's doing, our storm. Why me, Lord? And we're being protected. We just don't realize we're actually being protected. But help me out here. What are some ways that we might get offended at God? Jules, how might we get offended? I don't think you're the kind that gets offended at God easy. Oh, but yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, not really. What's some ways that we might get offended with when, God? When someone's going through a difficult issue, we might sort of think to ourselves, Where is, is God? He really listening? Is he really listening? Yeah. Can anyone else relate to that? Can anyone else here relate to the fact that if you've got someone going through a health issue, you might say, why is God not hearing our prayers or something like that? Is it so, sorry, Sean, what were you going to say? Yeah, we think kids pass us uh, husband and wife, and if I was angry with Sarah, it's never. Just keep going. Yeah, so you might sort of wonder why, why that happens. Yeah. Any other suggestions how we could get offended with God? Why evil happens, like... Yeah, that's a big one, isn't it? Why evil happens. Immorality just... Why it's allowed, yeah. Free, free will. Like that's free will. Yeah. 
it, 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 is, it, it can be a challenge sometimes. Rob, does anything come to you about why we might get offended with God? It's easy to do and not always easy to identify why we're doing it either. So look, I've got seven. You might come up with some others. Yeah, sorry, you... Yes, bingo. As a friend. Yeah. But I've noticed some people think of God more as a restrictive, controlling... Angry, yeah. And I think they get offended. So I think it's a lack of knowledge and a lack of understanding of who God is. Perfect. That's an excellent answer. Yeah. No. And if we'd stayed with that knowledge, it would have made sense eventually. It starts, yeah. The pieces come yeah. together. Yeah. It starts to really make sense. Yeah. It does, yeah. Oh, that's missing that's the pieces of the jigsaw, and it's very difficult to focus when you start. Yeah. And I think that really is, you go cool, that really is a big answer. You know, the answer to how to get out of offense with God is let God give you that wisdom and that understanding as to what's really going on. It's how we can get out of it. Right, yes. That is, that is not actually connecting and dealing with the circumstances. No, that's so good what you're saying there. I'm gonna, it, after we've looked at these offences, I'm going to give three statements of Jesus about offence and one sort of expand where he expands on that. But, but you've nailed it there too, Cor, in that when we're like a child, when we're like a child, we're a lot harder to offend. There's a lot less of that ego there, isn't there, that, that we, get, we carry in the way. And we, so we interpret... This is an attack from you or from God or something else. But when we're a child, we're, we're much more able just to keep our hand holding our father's hand and just keep moving forward with God. Okay, so here's... Th th these are not necessarily the best or the right or whatever. They're just seven that I really meditated upon. First, and with Ian's help, because I was talking to Ian about this the other day, the not fair mantra. Who knows the not fair mantra? Oh, haven't you hear, you hear it a lot with teenagers? <laughs> you hear it with young people. The not fair. That's just not fair. Who told you that's not fair? Who? Whose value system are you going by? What's not fair about it? Okay. And one of the things that's really helped me is this conviction and belief all things work to good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. Romans 8, 28. This belief that God is actually working all things, even the bad stuff. It's not that he's doing the bad stuff. He's not swallowing you with a beast. He's not throwing storms at you. We're doing that to ourselves. We're doing that to ourselves, but he's in there causing that to our good. Okay, the not fair mantra, you know? Think about Joseph. He tells his brother a dream. They hate him, throw him into prison, uh, uh, sell him off as a prisoner into Egypt. That doesn't sound fair. Okay, the blessing of God is on him. So Potiphar figures out this guy, this kid's great. I'll put him in charge of this, I'll put him in charge of that. Everything he does works. Well, then his part of his wife starts eyeing this young boy out. And says, oh, lie with me. She says, I will not do that. You're my master's wife. That's not right. So she tears her clothes and cries foul and has him put to prison. What's fair about that? Really, what's fair about that? But what's fascinating as you go along in Joseph's story is you realise he's being prepared for something much bigger. If he wouldn't sleep with another woman when she came at him, because of integrity, he's the right man to be in charge of Egypt later on, isn't he? He's given charge over all of Egypt, right, because of that integrity. 
Now, I'm not saying God was testing him. It's the devil that tests. Right? But the Lord turns it all into good in that sense. Always. Okay, not fair. How about this one? Unanswered prayer. We said that. I like to tell myself every prayer is answered. It's just not coming necessarily in the way that I want to hear it. Or, or, or the biggest one I see with unanswered prayer, you know, Jesus tells a parable of a widow who couldn't get any justice out of a judge. So she nags the heck out of this judge, right? And the judge says, oh, this woman, oh, I am not scared of men. I care not about justice. But if I don't give this woman what she wants, she will drive me insane. Oh, have your justice, woman. Jesus is telling a parable like this and says, when you pray, be like that. Isn't that interesting? He's saying, don't give up. Because maybe what you're calling God saying no is actually you just haven't hung out long enough. You haven't sweated out long enough. You haven't you know, stayed there long enough. And the perfect example is, is Daniel. He's, he's reading in Jeremiah's prophecy that they're supposed to go home to Israel and rebuild Jerusalem. So he says, God, when? Sets himself to fast. Fast one day, two day, three day. There goes me. I'm gone after about three days. Four days, five. Three weeks go by. He's still fasting. He hasn't quit. And on day 21, an angel, Gabriel, turns up and says, Oh, beloved Daniel, the moment you started praying, God said yes. God said yes, amen. The moment you asked him, it was yes. But... I've been held up by the prince spirit of Persia, a demon, these 21 days until Michael could come to my aid. That's such a good story because what are you waiting on God right now for? What are you asking God for? Hasn't said yes to it, so it appears. And are you really wrestling with God or, or, or spirits, evil spirits? You know, that's kind of what the story's telling us there. Okay, three. Oh, this is a big one. This is such a big one. Prosperity. Who, who believes God's into prosperity? Absolutely. Do you think you're going to be poor in heaven? Starving? Hungry? Without, you know, you know? Not, never. God doesn't do things. He prospers. But, Paul says, whether I am prospering or abased, I will praise God. Joseph, while he was in prison, was still praising God. You might have times where you are being tested. God's plan is to prosper you and bless you. That's the plan in the end. And you just got to hold on like the little child to your father's hand. But too easy for us to start walking the spiritual path and we go, this is costing me too much. It's asking too much of me. And it's like you said, Rob, when we understand what's really at stake, your eternal soul is at stake in terms of where do I end up? Was well, there a price too great? Not really. But in the middle of that battle, you might be feeling like, I'm quitting this. This is too much. I'm out of here. You're a bunch of hypocrites anyway. <laughs> Which is my, n not you, but that's my point. That's my next point, okay? Right? It's the next one after that, sorry. It, you, we're not getting what we expect, okay? You're not getting what you expect. You have an expectation of how God should do things. It doesn't work out that way. That's another reason we can get offended at God. That one kind of goes without saying. But who here has maybe seen somebody getting really, really, really blessed and thinking, what am I doing wrong? Why, why is this always stumbling for me? Isn't it? So we can have these expectations. But, okay, so this is the one I was trying to get offended. I could get offended with God because you offend me and you claim to be a Christian or a follower of God or something like that, a spiritual person. So then I can get offended at God because of that. In fact, in the book of Isaiah, now this is to the Israelites, but it says, uh, the book of Isaiah, the prophet says, O oh Israel, the Gentiles are blaspheming my name all day long because of how you treat them. Think about that. If we flip that into Christianity now, how many people maybe said, if that's God, the way you treat people, I want nothing to do with it. But then the next one's kind of a flip on the head, you know, being offended at someone being offended for someone. Ever done that? Ever taken up somebody else's offence for them? That's not right. Wow, wait till they get a word. Wait, wait till they hear from me. I'm going to tell them a thing or two. It's just too easy to slip into these habits, isn't it? And number seven, this one's tough. Being offended at a teaching of God. 
Whether it's right or wrong, it could be that we misunderstand it totally. Hey, Rob, we just totally misunderstand what the Lord's saying. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. He says, minutes later, he says, flesh profits nothing. My words are spirit and life. But they weren't listening. By that stage, they'd walked off and gone away. They weren't listening anymore to what he was teaching. Right, so we can get offending, offended at a teaching because we don't understand it. And I'm going to, we can also get offended at a teaching because we just don't like it. Right? There are some things in the Bible that challenge us and we just don't like it. And we can say that's wrong and it's not. Okay, so there's seven reasons why we can get offended. Here's quickly, we're coming to a close now. Um, three things that Jesus says about offense. It's beautiful what he says here and then he sort of expands on it in the last one. Let's have a look. <coughs> John 17. Then said he unto the disciples, here it comes. Then said he unto the disciples, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. We're living in a world that's going to offend you, promised, guaranteed. But woe to him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hung about his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones which is really the Lord's way. He's talking in that parabolic language and he's saying uh, sometimes people will have, uh, sometimes the Lord will have people so caught up in life, so caught up running the treadmill, trying to get famous, trying to get rich, trying to get this, and it's better. The Lord leaves them go that way. Because if they sought a spiritual path and then went into spiritual things and then turned from that, they would have damaged the little ones. The Lord keeps the little ones protected. And we're not just talking about children, we are, but we're also talking about those hidden truths in the word that are so precious, so special, that if, you, if they're revealed to you, they're for you and you alone. And so sometimes people, even though they're walking a spiritual life, they're just so busy on the treadmill and their consciousness is so deep, it's in the bottom of the ocean, they're reading the word and not getting it anyway. They're not getting those deeper truths because they would profane them and defile those deeper truths. And then Jesus says here in the parable of the sower, sower goes out to sow seed and he throws his seed out. Some of it falls on good ground, some of it falls in rocky ground, some falls in weeds, and some falls on a footpath. And the birds, Satan, come and eat the seed that's on the footpath. But look what he says about when it falls into a stony heart. And you might think, stony heart? Well, you know, this person really offended me and did wrong by me and I have, it, you know, I, I, for years now, I've not spoken to that person and I've chose to, you know, to punish them. You might be dealing with a real big stone in your heart there. It's possible, right? So Jesus says, He that receives seed into the stony places, the same as he that hears the word, anon with joy receives it. Yet he has no root in himself. He endures for a while, but when tribulation and persecution arises, because of the word. Tribulation and persecution arises because you are carrying the most precious thing this planet has. Revelation of God, the word. It, it kind of brings it on. It just brings it on, brings the tribulation and persecution on. But because, you've got, because the word's there and hell wants to take it away from you and there's no root, what happens? By and by he is offended. So this is the strategy that the hells want. They want to they want to rob us of his word and want to take that away from us by getting us offended. And then one last one, I love this, Jesus called a little child to him and he set him in the midst of them and he said, truly I say to you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom. And that goes back to what you were saying, Cor, how my ego interprets that as an attack. You're attacking me. God, what are you doing? It's the ego again. But what the Lord is saying, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven in here, be the little child. You know, Trust your father. Whatever it is that's going on, trust your father that there's, there's a good reason for it. And, and don't let the ego get in and get offended and, and stop that process. But I also like the way he says, 
Uh, if you will humble yourself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. There's a lot in that word humble. There's a huge amount in that word humble. But let's just start with trust. Let's say, whosoever shall trust the Lord as this little child does, the same shall be the greatest in the kingdom. Amen. Just, just say a prayer for me. Just say, Lord, protect the child that you have placed in my heart. Keep me from offense, Lord. Keep me trusting you. Keep my eyes off storms and solely on you. Amen. Okay, and so one last passage from the Lord, which is kind of expanding a little bit. It's not about offense, but it's expanding on this child heart. And he says, At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and you have revealed them unto babes, even so, Father, so it seemed good in your sight. So when we learn to protect our heart from offence, we keep that innocent child inside us, the child of God, hold on to your Father's hand, keep going back to the Word of God with an innocent heart, with a, a sincere heart, it may not open itself up to you straight away, but know that you have this connection with God immediately, immediately have a connection with God, and the promise is, if you keep going back to that Word as a little child, the Lord is going to reveal to you all the deep mysteries that he keeps from all the sciences of this world, all the smart people, the clever people. Amen? Let's just say one more prayer. Just say, Dear Lord, keep my heart hungry for your word. Reveal your treasures. And may I treasure them and share them with those who love you too. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Okay, so I hope that's, I hope I didn't bore you there with some of that idea of just trying to, this idea of how big God is and how heaven is really about us having a relationship with him and it's our natural side, our natural senses that's always going to get offended. We, we just can't understand, I mean, even the idea that God became one of us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Really. I believe that with all my heart. But if you go with this and you go with your natural senses, you, you're just going to do your head in. It's going to do your head in. So be the little child that just says, I trust you, God. You, I trust your plan. No one else has the words of life. Amen? Amen. All right. So the assignment for the month, if you so wish, is can you identify an area in your life where you consider it too small, insignificant, or ordinary for the Lord's attention? Our uh, Lord couldn't be bothered with that. The great, giant, universal God, all-powerful, yes, he cares about even the little things in your heart. So make a focus to talk to the Lord about these areas and let him minister his love and healing in that area of your life. Okay. So I'm just going to close the word if you join me in, in singing a new commandment as we do that. I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you that you love one another as I have loved you by thee shall all men know you are my disciple if you have love one for another. By this moment, you are my disciples. If you have love one for another, I As I have loved you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, by this shall all that you are my disciples, if you have loved one for another. 
By this shall all men know you are my disciple if you have love one for another. Dear Jesus, Lord, I ask that uh, you will keep us from ever being offended at your word. We may not understand, but may our hearts stay open. May we as children come freely and receive your truths and let your wisdom grace our hearts and minds. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his everlasting peace. I hope you go away with something encouraged this month to have some coffee and tea. And Sean and Sarah make beautiful coffee. Don't run away. Hang around if you're new and just say hello to some people. Thank you for being here.